been of the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, most high, you are without beginning or end and beyond our understanding. Your angel was sent to the righteous Joseph to dispel his fear. Now confirm us in your truth and make us worthy of your salvation. Keep us from doubt and protect our faith, that we may profess your miraculous birth and honor your pure mother Mary and the righteous Joseph. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with the church and her children. raise glory, honor, and praise to God the Father who sent his angel in a dream to righteous Joseph, and to the glorious Son who dwelt in the womb of the pure Virgin, and to the Holy Spirit who revealed the mystery of the Holy Virgin's conception. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. Glory be to you, O Christ, our God. You chose the most blessed among women to be your mother, and in a dream you revealed the mystery of your holy conception to righteous Joseph, to whom she was betrothed, filling him with all peace. And today we celebrate the feast of your divine revelation, the divine revelation that Joseph received, dispelling his doubt, the divine revelation that filled all believers with joy, the divine revelation that removed every doubt from Joseph regarding the purest of virgins. Now, O Lord, we implore you through the prayers of Mary, your mother, and Joseph, your chosen one, and with the fragrance of this incense that the celebration of this feast be for our salvation. Sanctify sinners and dispel all doubt and fear. Bring back those who are far and protect those who are near. May joy and peace fill the whole world, and love and unity dwell within our hearts. May the departed find rest in your heavenly kingdom, and we raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever. the sweet fragrance who fills the whole world. You remove fear from Joseph's heart and confirm the truth about Mary's conception. Accept our incense and fill our souls with joy and grant rest to all the departed that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever. Amen.
sanctify our minds and purify our consciences, that we may praise you with purity and listen to your holy scriptures. To you be glory forever. Fear, son of David, said the angel in a dream, for the child Mary carries is the Son of God most high. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Brothers and sisters, because of this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if, I, if as I suppose, you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for your benefit, namely, that the mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I have written briefly earlier, when you read this, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to human beings in other generations, as it now has been revealed to his holy apostles and the prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body, and co-partners in the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this, I became a minister by the gift of God's grace that was granted me in accord with this exercise of power. To me, the very least of all the holy ones, this grace was given, to preach to the Gentiles the inscrutable riches of Christ and to bring to light for all what is the plan of the mystery hidden from ages past in God who created all things, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be known through the church to the principalities and authorities in the heavens. This was according to the eternal purpose that was accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness of speech and confident of confidence of access through faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over my afflictions for you. This is your glory. Praise be to God always. For the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense, and we ask for your mercy, O Lord. <clears throat> Peace. 
peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, O listeners, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the word of the living God. The Apostle Matthew writes, Now this is the manner of the birth of Jesus the Christ has come about. When his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found with child through the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, as he was a righteous man, was yet unwilling to expose her to shame, and he decided to separate from her quietly. Such was his intention when, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home. For it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her, and she shall bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he shall save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph awoke, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took his wife into his home. He had no relations with her until she bore him a son, and he named him Jesus. This is the truth. Peace be with you. Praise and praise to Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. For hearing us his words of God, praise and praise to Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. To enlighten all men that they may see what is the dispensation of the mystery which has been hidden from eternity in God who created all things. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. This letter to the Ephesians, as we mentioned a couple weeks ago, is a letter which is considered by many of the exegetes to be written perhaps firstly to the Ephesians, but not exclusively to the Ephesians. As we also mentioned here, it is St. Paul's definitive expose on soteriology, on salvation. So when he lays out the question of the mystery, he's talking about how God actually plans in concrete to accomplish the salvation of the world. We've also mentioned this letter is towards the end of his life. He's in prison in Rome for the first time. The second time will end in martyrdom. This time, it's about the year 60, 62, early 60s. It's about four or five years before his martyrdom. So St. Paul has been pondering for the last decades the whole work of the Messiah, of this death and resurrection, the glorification of God's chosen one. And he lays it out as the mystery. Now, we talked about this a couple weeks ago by speaking about the term in the Greek coming from mystein, which is to keep silent. But the word which St. Paul is using is not from the Greek. It's from an Aramaic Hebrew background. Of course, he's a rabbi from Tarsus. And if you want to have an idea of its origin, you have to go back to the prophet Daniel, chapter 2. And in Daniel... It has the famous vision by King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar has a vision, one dream one night, of this 
multi-layered statue. There's gold in it, part of it's gold, part of it's silver, part of it's bronze, and then part of its legs are iron and clay. This is where we get our modern phrase about talking about someone or a project having clay feet. Because in this dream, the king sees then this huge stone dislodge itself from a mountain and it breaks this statue in pieces. And so the king's bewildered as to what this dream is meant to mean. What's hidden to him. And so he calls for Daniel. Now Daniel is a Hebrew, he's a Jew. And he's part of the deportation of the people in the conquest of Babylon, of Judea in the south. And there were two deportations. First they came in, they conquered the land, and they deport all of the upper classes, if you want, and all the educated classes. And they deport them back to Mesopotamia. Then the second deportation takes all of the craftsmen, all the artisans, and they deport them back to Mesopotamia. And it leaves behind the peasants, the day laborers, and kind of the working class. And so Daniel's among the nobility. He's among the educated classes as a young man, and he's deported. And he winds up actually being brought into the king's court. And that's why Daniel's there at the time. And it's known at the court that Daniel has the spirit of prophecy. And so when he's called, he gives an interpretation to the king about this thing which is hidden. But in Daniel, it's called Raza. R-O-Z, if you want, Raza. And it's the origin, what I've mentioned to you, that in our Syriac tradition, we don't... Perfect. When we talk about the sacraments or we talk about the mysteries, I've known some very zealous Maronites that say they're not sacraments, they're mysteries. And it's like, well, mystery has no more connection with us than the Latin word sacrament does. So you just choose between a Latin or a Greek word. If you want to be snooty about it, then the mass should be called the korban, for the alohoyo korbono, call it the korban, that would be great. And if you don't want to call them sacraments, then call them rose. Alohoye, rose, the divine mystery. But rose, what rose, as I mentioned to you before, is this word in Daniel comes from an ancient, it's an ancient Persian word. And it's a word used for the counsels of the king, his directives. So the church of the Syriac tradition took this Persian word as the directives of the king, but of course of the celestial king, of the hidden one, who manifests himself and unfolds the work of his redemption and his creation in which we, make, we take part. And so in those very concentrated forms of that revelation and directive and consecration and holiness, baptism, penance, Eucharist, holy orders, the holy crowning in matrimony. These are the moments in which the divine king manifests himself particularly. And therefore they are rose, rose. One rose, two rose. And so this is the origin of St. Paul talking about the mystery which has been hidden from before the creation of the world. And he's saying now in our generation it's given to us to be able to preach this. As I wrote to you earlier, he's talking about chapter one that we talked about a couple weeks ago. As he says, it's been given to me now to preach this mystery, to make it known, to articulate it and unfold it in, so that you see it in your lives. And he says, this was given to me by revelation. Outside Damascus, when our Lord appeared in full glory before him, knocked him off his horse, blinded him, threw him to the ground, that is the mystery being unfolded in the life of Saul of Tarsus. I have a plan for you. 
And he tells the other Christians in Damascus, God, the angel, that he is a chosen vessel to bring my name to the nations. And so St. Paul, when he's talking about this, this precise moment when the Messiah enters into the world, it is this revelation. Now for those who are coming from a Western tradition, we all know the image of the Sacred Heart. Theologically, what the Sacred Heart is representing is a number of things. We know it as the love of Jesus you know, incarnate, the word incarnate, and that's true. But that is not the only thing it represents. It represents also that redemptive love which is also suffering. Therefore, the crown iconographically is crowned with, the, the heart is crowned with thorns. It's wounded. There's the fire of charity bursting out of it and there is a cross plunged into it which St. Margaret Mary Alacoque said that it represents and signifies that our Lord from the moment of his conception had his sufferings before his eyes. But it also represents, besides just his human love and this redemptive sacrificial love, it also represents the uncreated eternal love, which is simply God, the divinity. So it represents on several levels the unfolding of what St. Paul today is he's here speaking of as being the mystery, the rose. And so what he's saying here is that the plan of God in the person of Christ, in the Messiah, he is the mystery being unveiled to us, unfolded. And as we go through the season of announcements, we are moving in preparation to that birth of the word incarnate closer and closer from outward, historically even, to closer now to St. Joseph and next week the genealogy linking our Lord as son of David. But he also says that the unfolding of this mystery, this manifestation, is also to speak to you that the Gentiles are also being brought into this work of redemption along with Israel. So it's a very beautiful image. But we have to remember that it's also on a personal level. That mystery is not something that's just revealed 2,000 years ago. It is something that is being unfolded in the lives of each one of us every day if we have the ears to hear, as our Lord says continually in the Gospel. Let him who has the ears to hear, let him hear. And he's saying, be vigilant, be attentive. So the unfolding of the mystery also has a personal aspect to it. And as we go through these weeks towards the nativity and Christmas, we ask for the grace through the intercession, especially today of St. Joseph, that he obtained for us this delicacy of soul and of spirit to be able to hear, to be able to see, and to be able then to follow the unfolding of this divine light in our Lord, uh, in our lives that we call the Rosal. Which is why St. Paul finishes at the end of this what essentially is a digression in the letter. You read one, two, and four, and this, most of this part three, this chapter three is a digression about the mystery. But he says, I'm in prison. I am locked up. You know the things that I'm suffering, my tribulations. But you'll notice the last line of the epistle as we have it today. He says, I beg you, do not, the term literally is faint. Don't give up because I'm in chains. Because this, in fact, is for your glory. As he says in another one of his letters, I may be shackled, but the word of God is never chained. The only thing that can muffle, that can suffocate the word of God, the only thing that can, in a sense, shackle God's plan is our lack of fidelity, our lack of hearing, our lack of listening in our lives. But other than that, the power of God is omnipotent and he will accomplish what he wants. We are the only ones who can stunt the work of the apostolate. We are the only ones personally that can stunt the unfolding of the divine Rosa. 
And when we understand that, then we understand that last line of St. Paul. For this reason, I beg you not to weaken. At the sight of the tribulations I have for you, for your sake, because these things are your glory. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Telvot ma de peda loho, walvot aloho da pari tayu. Wake us of what I will talk, hail and I'll bite off with good and pay it low, or go and show.
Almighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you. Out of their love for you and for your holy name, shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Charbel. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. to the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Lord God and Father, you are true love, security that is ever sure and hope that never fails. Grant love, happiness, and everlasting peace to your children here before you. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and souls and with the holy kiss worthy of your blessed name that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith. Send us your grace and glorious blessings from the heights of your heavenly sanctuary. 
that we may glorify you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, you sent your beloved Son at the appointed time for our salvation, and he gave us these holy and life-giving mysteries. Do not look upon us as strangers, and do not turn your holy face away from us because of our many sins. For you alone are the Holy One with your only Son and your Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just. It is right and just to praise you, O Lord of all in heaven and on earth. The powers on high in the heavens where they dwell glorify you. The fiery ranks exalt you, the cherubim bless you, and the seraphim worship you. They cry out and they proclaim. Son and your Holy Spirit, one and indivisible in nature, and you sanctify all things by your divine power. For our salvation you sent your Son into the world. He descended, became flesh, suffered, and was crucified for us, who had distorted his image. <speaking in Hebrew> coming, we implore your mercy and compassion, 
We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy rest upon us. O Christ our God, we remember your plan of salvation, and we implore your goodness. When you come in glory with your holy angels, and all await the reward they deserve, and when you place the sheep to the right and the goats to the left, do not look upon us as strangers to your household, and do not turn your holy face away from us. Do not let our sins and offenses pierce your holy heart, and do not separate us from you. For we have professed your holy name and have proclaimed your divinity. Rather treat us according to your promises. Forgive our sins, pardon us, and have mercy upon your inheritance. For this your repentant church implores you, and through you, and with you, implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father, have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them, and because of them, we praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you, and we ask you, have compassion on us, O God, have mercy on us, and hear us. How awesome is this moment, O my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Adin morio, adin morio, adin morio, nite modo rojo chayu kadisho. Una chena lai nu al korbo no hono. And he may make this bread the body of Christ our God. Amen. And make the mixture in this chalice the blood of Christ our God. Amen. May these holy mysteries sanctify the bodies and souls of those who share in them, cleanse their hearts, purify their thoughts, and be a pledge of the heavenly kingdom and new life forever. Amen. O Lord, we now remember in this sacrifice all the holy churches and the shepherds of the true faith, especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, Shara Peter, our patriarch of Antioch, Nisrala Peter, our retired patriarch, Gregory John, our bishop, and all bishops. With them, we remember the priests, the deacons, and all who serve your holy church. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord of goodness, your holy church, and have mercy on all her faithful. In your compassion, heal all the wounded and injured among your flock. Punish injustice and strengthen all our brothers and sisters. Bestow the grace of conversion on all. With your indestructible power, strengthen the bishops of the true faith, that they may be upright and courageous in their apostolic office. May they show fidelity as they stand ever before your eternal justice. Unto your honor and glory, may they prove themselves upright, dauntless, and persevering in the task confided to them to lead all faithful into the fullness of your redeeming light and glory. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace and stability of the whole world, for a blessed and prosperous year, for an abundant harvest, for the sick and the oppressed, for all who call upon your holy name on land, at sea, or in the air, and who profess that you are the true God, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
Remember, O Lord, those who have presented the offerings upon this altar and those who desired to do so but were unable, and grant them their petitions. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. We remember all the saints, the fathers, prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, Mary, the mother of God, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Marin, St. Charbel, and all the righteous and the just. Through their prayers, make us worthy to stand among them. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, in your grace, those who have left us and have gone to you from the first Christian disciples to this day. They were signed with the seal of baptism and received the precious body and blood of your Son. They wait for you in your life-giving hope. Raise them up on the last day, and in your mercy forgive all their sins. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed. With or without full knowledge. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Father, you accept prayers and answer petitions. You taught us through your beloved Son to stand before you, to call upon you with pure souls, with clear consciences, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation and from the harm of evil. For you have power over all. We raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior who gives life to those who partake of him, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, in your grace and abundant mercy, bless those who bow before you. Make us worthy to share in your life-giving mysteries, and to join the assembly of your saints, that with them we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. 
The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord, Lord our God, to you be glory forever.
Gracious God and Father, how can we repay you for your goodness and for the salvation you have just given us? Who can give you the glory you truly deserve? In our weakness, insofar as we are able, we worship, praise, and thank you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Jesus Christ, our God, we worship, thank, and praise you. We implore your goodness and abundant mercy for the salvation of the whole world, for the protection of the living and eternal rest to the departed, for the feeding of the hungry and the support of the needy, for the visiting of the sick and the consolation of the grieving. Through your grace dwell in them. By your abundant mercy give them life. By your holy cross bless your people and protect your inheritance. Adoration is due to you, to your Father, and to your holy and life-giving Spirit, now and forever. So our esteemed subdeacon informed me yesterday that there's been a whole chain of emails going on about Christmas Eve. Now, first of all, I solicit and petition all goodwill from everyone. I am not trying, as one email sent to me said, trying to shudder the parish. I am trying to desperately keep it afloat, on the contrary. So why the question of the hour? First of all, Bishop Gregory has been asking us for the last years, plural, to restore the Midnight Mass. Maine is too geriatric for us to do Midnight Masses. It's way past our bedtime. A point number two at the cathedral in Brooklyn, our mother church, our standard, has their vigil at 7 p.m. on Christmas Eve plus a midnight mass. So that's our standard. And the third thing is, is that for the entire last year, 12 months at least, every single holy day, the mass of the vigil has been at 6 p.m. Of course, you have to come to the holy days to know the hours, but the last year has been 6 p.m. for every holy day of obligation. Christmas being one of the 12. Only one of them, of the 12, but one of them. You will also find that in the Catholic parishes around, they do have a 4 p.m. Mass. That is the earliest hour possible. But the other parishes have a 4 p.m. Mass because if you look at their schedule, they have another one at 6 or another one at 10. So it's 2. So they make one early because you've got one later also. So out of compassion and for your culinary schedules, though I will never subordinate the sacred mysteries for purely social or culinary needs. But having said that, this is the first year that seems to have caught off guard. We will have Christmas Eve at 4 p.m. this year. You're forewarned 12 months in advance that next year it will be 6 p.m. And now you should be very grateful that I didn't spend $400 to put this in the newspaper because we'd be changing it the week before Christmas. So 4 p.m. We'll be happy to see you. The choir will sing its lovely choral carols at 3.30. And... Go in peace then, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. And may the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.
Amen.